have several both audio and video interviews with him. We also have a radio show. We just did a radio show just a couple days ago in which we were interrupted. We were actually, for the first time since June, thrown off the air, all three of us, simultaneously. Didn't happen before. But we've had interruptions once in a while. We, one of us gets dropped, not often, usually at an opportune moment, but maybe not at all that whole day, but whatever. Um, so that's always a, a sign we're on the right track. I guess we should thank them for being so obvious. <laughs> it's always a thought. So anyway, I just want to say that uh, David Wilcock is, is a really stellar individual, as ed everyone here knows. And um, we, we thank him very much for being who he is and for putting himself in such a dedicated place to serve humanity with his life. And, and we honor him for that, and we, we um, stand right at his side, okay? Um, so that doesn't mean we agree on everything, or how it'll roll out, or this or that, but in, in the main, we agree, all right? And, and, uh, and we're very happy to, to present him here today. David Wilcock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. All right, uh, we do have a lot of material to cover. We don't have a lot of time. Um, how many people here need a bathroom break, or are you ready to just keep going? Just go? All right. Now, you video guys, um, do you need me to wear a lavalier mic for the video recording? Or you're okay? All right. The other thing is, are you, if you guys are doing this live streaming, can you cut back and forth between my slides and my face as it's going out live? Can you do that? Okay. Because um, there's going to be a lot of slides, and they will go fairly quickly. <clears throat> okay, now we've gotten the business taken care of. Let's get down to the real work, which is this subject of 2012. What I will be proposing tonight is definitely not your typical approach to 2012. It is very important to understand on an intrinsic level that what we are dealing with is not channeling, it is not Mayan prophecy, it is not ancient religious teaching, it is not speculation, it is not psychic, it does not require anything except the exacting measurement of the scientific process and the insight to be able to take information that has already been put out there by NASA, by mainstream scientists studying the mysteries of what it means to be a biological life form, the mysteries of the solar system, the mysteries of energy and matter, and how does matter and energy truly function. When you start looking at the hidden mysteries of science, which are already out there now, you find out that the human species is undergoing a massive evolutionary process right now, and I'm gonna prove that to you. I'm gonna prove to you that the nature of this evolutionary process fundamentally rewrites DNA and biological life to such an extreme that within one generation, I will show you the proof in this presentation that a creature can give birth to something that becomes an entirely different species than the creature that it came out of the womb from. And that there is nothing more that needs to be done to create that energetic change but to simply zap the embryo with a light wave that comes from another embryo that has the genetic pattern that you wish to transfer. The only way that this makes any sense is to begin seeing DNA as susceptible to quantum wave effects. You may have seen, most of you have probably seen 2012 Enigma. 
which is a video of mine I'm proud to say was number one most viewed on Google December 1st of last year. And the reason why it got that way is because the information has rocked the internet. It has led to my getting the starring position on a sci-fi documentary coming out in November on Sci-Fi Network. It's led to Penguin contacting me to write a book based on the video, one of the biggest publishing companies out there. It's led to my working with, I'm going to say this now publicly, Jim Hart, who wrote the movie Contact with Judy, Jodie Foster. That's our screenwriter. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I'm working on Wander Awakening, which is the album cover you see here in the slide, with a nine-time Grammy-winning musician, Larry Sire. The reason why all this big talent and why all this attention is being focused here is not because I may have been somebody else in another lifetime, it's not because I have done psychic readings, it's not because I put prophecies on the internet that later were shown to come true. The biggest thing that I bring to the planet right now is to simply look at ancient prophecies that we know to exist, that we can document in great detail, and to then give a scientific framework for these prophecies on such an advanced level that we're looking at things in an entirely different way. So let's get back to 2012 Enigma for a minute. You've, most of you have seen that video. You may remember that I discuss an experiment that was conducted in which a tiny, what's called buckyball, was shot through a grating. And the grating is 100 nanometers wide. The buckyball itself is only about one or two nanometers wide. It goes through the grating and it turns into a wave. The buckyball itself, which is supposed to be a macroscopic object, goes through this little slit and for whatever reason it turns into a non-local wave. <clears throat> now what does quantum non-locality really mean? It means that you don't know where the wave is in space. You also don't know where the wave is in time. Quantum non-locality shows that the more you try to find out where it is in time, the less you can find it in space. The more you try to find out where it is in space, the less you can find it in time. And if you look at the quantum physics equations, it's well known in quantum mechanics, the time has to be both backwards, forwards, it has to be completely nonlinear in the traditional sense. Albert Einstein has given us the theory of relativity. The theory of relativity is going to tell you that when you travel through space, it's not empty space. What did Einstein call space? He didn't call it space, he called it space-time. The reason why he called it space-time is that he said you're moving through something that makes time start running faster as you go through space. So that you could literally be inside a spaceship, leave the Earth for two weeks, flying at the speed of light, come back, and it's 500 years later. We know that this has been proven. It actually was done on jumbo jets flying in the highest altitude they could, where they had little uh, watches on them, or little uh, radioactive timekeeping devices, and they found very subtle but definite changes in the speed of time just based on the velocity of a jet going around Earth orbit. So imagine what happens when you go up towards light speed. Now this is a proven principle in physics. As you move through space, you're also moving through the so-called time fabric. The space-time fabric, as Einstein called it. There was a mistake that Einstein made in his scientific understanding of space-time. And it may be a mistake, or it may be that he figured it out, and he didn't want to talk about what he discovered. In the Einstein relativity theory, it is assumed that the only direction you can move is into the future. That space-time, the time dimension is only one-dimensional. But we actually now know from the physics of Dewey Larson, which you'll also see on my 2012 Enigma video, that the whole way that the quantum world is being built is that there is a domain in which time as we think of it is three-dimensional and space as we think of it is one-dimensional. And that world 
is constantly interchanging energy back and forth with space-time. We call it time-space over there. It's space-time over here. So this time-space realm over there is sending energy into space-time and is pinging back and forth, and that's what creates matter. The reason why this is important is that if you can get over into time-space, then you can actually travel a physical distance and return to space-time, and you have now time-traveled. And it's not just the future. You can actually travel into the past. If you're traveling in the direction that the Earth is rotating, and you travel ahead of where the Earth was rotating when you left, you're going to end up in the future. Because you now re-emerge in space-time ahead of where the Earth was on its timeline when you left. If you travel west, that's into the past. East is the future, west is the past. And again, it's going to sound ridiculous, and for those who are uneducated, they'll blast me on the internet and say that I'm full of it. But the fact of the matter is, this is very much provable stuff. I've had people write me and say that the science in 2012 Enigma is, is ridiculous. Well, go to reciprocalsystem.com, read Dewey Larson's books, because there's several of them, and find out for yourself how he breaks down every single problem in quantum mechanics and shows you got to have three-dimensional time. So all we're saying is, if you can get over into time space, it's going to look like everything does here because every atom and molecule around me right now is here because it's exchanging with time space. So there's time space stuff in every place around me. That means all this stuff exists as a parallel structure in a parallel universe. And when you go over there, it becomes your three dimensions of space. It's going to look the same because the energy of it is the same energy that's here in space time. Now, here's where it gets really confusing, if it's not already confusing. <laughs> See, my mind, I just, I don't have to worry about this stuff. It comes in very naturally. You actually have an energetic pair to your physical body, which is in time-space, okay? But there are all these bonuses that your energy body has in time space that your physical body doesn't have here. What I'm literally telling you is that every nook and cranny, every little funny fold of your brain exists as a parallel energetic structure that is coupled with the cells in your brain that interfaces with the cells in your brain, that interfaces with every molecule of DNA in your body. And that is where all thought processes are actually occurring. They're not occurring in your nervous system at all in terms of intellect. The body does produce certain forms of thought. You have an autonomic nervous system. You have a cerebellum that keeps you from falling over. It makes sure that you're balanced by working with the fluid in the chamber of your ear, the cochlea. You have all of the basic systems that are going to make sure that your heart is beating, that your lungs are breathing, that your eyes are not taking in all the information peripherally so that you can focus on what you're looking at. You have a screening mechanism that's going to screen out background noise so that if there's a television on and somebody's talking to you, you're going to listen to them talking and not hear the television. You're not going to hear all the input and weigh it the same. Those types of things are biologically driven systems. The body makes those thoughts for you. But all of the actual intellect, all of the actual thinking that you're going to be doing in your mind is not in the body at all. You have a parallel body, a parallel brain, a parallel nervous system that is an energetic nervous system. But it doesn't look like your physical body because your physical body doesn't have billions and billions of strings coming out of it. It doesn't have an instantaneous energetic connection that you can visibly see to everything else in its environment. What I'm asking you to visualize as strings is actually simply an energy field. And in time space, you are part of that energy field, and your mind is not simply that which is created within your own energy field. It very much is affected <clears throat> by all these other things that are around you, including the thoughts of other people. The very fascinating case of Norman Mailer, famous novelist who wrote a novel called Barbary Shore. In this novel, 
He starts out writing about one main character and gradually changes the novel to write about a Russian spy. The Russian spy becomes the focus of the entire novel. He goes into great detail. Within the same week that he finishes Barbary Shore, a Russian spy was arrested in his same building that he was living in. Just up the stairs and down the hallway. Now, does this mean that there was a conduit that was going through the air vent so that he could hear what this guy was saying? Of course not. What it does mean, though, is that that man was so emotionally charged because he was on the edge of his rope and he knew he was going to get caught that his mind was sending out signals. And Norman Mailer's mind is an energetic phenomenon which is sensitive to its environment and picked up the signals that were being generated. Now, again... I talked about the experiment where buckyballs are shot through a 100 nanometer grate, a little tiny slit. They turn into a wave just by hitting the grate. It's like it makes them flip inside out and go from space time, where they're a particle, into time space. That solid particle, which has 120 atoms in it, it's not just like some tiny little thing. It's a ball. It's got structure. It's got form. It's got shape. It literally popped out of our space time entirely. It flipped over into a realm where time is three-dimensional, space is one-dimensional, and it smears out. It's partly in the past, it's partly in the present, it's partly in the future. And in that state, it looks like a wave because you can't measure where everything is anymore. So now get a load of this. The DNA molecule is only slightly wider than a buckyball, which means the DNA molecule is also subject to quantum effects in which the molecules within your DNA are phasing between being here in space-time and being in time-space where they actually are stretched out through linear time. And they're sensitive to all the other energy fields around them. Now again, this is science. All we're doing is we're starting with Einstein's relativity. We're saying that as you move through space, you move through time. The faster you move through space, the faster you're traveling through time. In time-space, you can move not just into the future, but into the past as well, depending on what direction you're traveling. The Russians have identified the time field, which means that if you speed up the time field in a small area, time will run faster or slower in that area compared to everything else around it. And they've got lots of experiments with little wristwatches and stuff where they put them in the time field, and the time field makes it speed up or slow down. Now... Pyramids are one of those things that will make those watches change speed. So a pyramid is an actual symbol of something that will cause change to occur. The pyramid is a symbol, but it's also a technology. It's also a machine. The symbol of the pyramid is that which is reaching up. It's something that's reaching for the heavens. It represents geometry, and there is geometry that makes this energy field of the time field I'm talking about function. It's all based on geometry, which is more complex than we're going to do in this presentation. But the time field is something which not only affects the passage of linear time, it also affects the health of your body. The more of this time field is flowing through your body, the healthier you're going to be. And paradoxically, the slower you're going to age. It's when the flow of the time field stops that you move out of eternity, that you move out of timelessness. It's when time stops flowing through you that you stop being an eternal being and you begin aging. Remember that scientific study that Deepak Chopra talked about in Ageless Body, Timeless Mind, where he gets a bunch of elderly people, and he puts them in a room where it has the magazines of 40 years ago, it has the radio broadcasts, it has all the furniture, all the everything. What he found was that within a very short period of time, all these people had a remarkable turnaround where they started reverse aging. They actually started getting younger in a way that is molecularly, biologically provable. That's because the time field started flowing again. They started to have hope. The time field is that which gives you inspiration. 
If you want to know whether the time field is really flowing through you or not, you can tell because you will be in a state of uplifting gratitude and positive emotion. It is a scientific fact that the more that your mind goes into that state of resonance, of positive attitude, of fearlessness, of courage, you are causing time to flow through you faster, which means you have the power of eternity at your fingertips, which means you are at the forefront of the human evolutionary process. But this is not something that only relies upon your ingenuity and your dedication to a spiritual path. It is something that is being done for you by forces that are very mysterious because they are much greater than what you would normally think of as your conscious mind. You want to talk about the monolith in 2001 and how mysterious that was. That's not even the beginning of what we're talking about now. This big stone slab shows up and all of a sudden all those cavemen learn how to use tools and they can kill each other now and they become the dominant species. And then at the, the point where the movie goes into the present, the monolith shows up on the moon and Commander David Bowman at the end of the movie ends up becoming the new Adam, the new species of humanity after he goes through a stargate. There's a lot of things that are known on the inside, and this stuff is not a secret. It's not a secret even though it has been kept secret. It has been attempted to be kept secret. It is not secret. All of the information we need is already here, so that we can definitively understand that what's happening to the earth is a naturally occurring process. It is a sacred process motivated by forces of intelligence that would stagger the imagination. Back in the old days, you had a land system in which a computer was just a monitor and a typewriter and you plugged it up to one central computer and everybody's little dummy terminal, as it was called, was plugged into that one computer. On some level, each of us is the dummy terminal. We appear to be separate. We appear to be a, an identity that has an ego, that has a body, and we identify with the body. On some grander level, the body is merely a projection. It's like if you have a prism and light is going through the prism and as it rotates you see these rainbows around the room. And each one of you is one of those rainbows. But would you say that those rainbows are each a, an individual generator of light? No. The light is generated by whatever is striking the prism. Those individual pieces of rainbow light are just the reflections of the one light that strikes the prism. If you want to really get into the esoteric science and understand what the ancient prophecies are telling us and why it's so relevant to what you're going to hear in this talk, try to vibe into the fact that the entire manifest universe, that matter and energy itself, is but reflections of this one singular light that all visibility in the universe, everything we can measure, is a reflection into what we think is space and what we think is time. But when you start really understanding what time is, you realize you can go whatever direction you want, forwards, backwards, and sideways. And when you understand space, you realize that space doesn't pose any obstacle if you can pop through to time space, back and forth from space time to time space. You can wormhole yourself or portal yourself or whatever they want to call it from any point in the universe to any other instantaneously. That's how it's done because there is no actual location. Location is an illusion which is based on the rules of the road so that we have one intelligent super being that has wanted to experience multiplicity, that has wanted to experience separation so that it can reunify. In terms of how that functions in our galaxy, Galaxies generating intelligent waves, which you're going to see the proof for in this presentation. And those waves upgrade the speed of this time field, or of what I call the source field. The speed of vibration of the source field is going up. 
If that speed represents how well you think, it's no different than you upgrading your computer and going from this ridiculously bad processor where you could barely even get any of your websites to load because it takes so long and getting this really fast machine where now every page <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> she almost jumped right out of her seat. <clears throat> I'll try to do that a little more delicately next time. Is that better? Okay. So, you, got, you, you broke me out of my trance now. Now I gotta actually talk from the ego. How's it going, man? <laughs> what the hell was I talking about? All right, let's see. We gotta re... We gotta get the download back in play here. <clears throat> when we understand that this energy field is part of the galaxy, that the galaxy is a conscious being. The galaxy has energy that must be conscious. The energy that's in the entire universe must be conscious and it must create life. Life is the divine imprimatur of all energy in the universe. All energy in the universe is built to create life. The physicists call this the Goldilocks principle and they don't even have a clue as to how far the Goldilocks principle goes. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. That's what they're talking about in terms of planets like ours and how we have just the right amount of oxygen, just the right amount of water, just the right temperature. All these things are perfect. It's not an accident. Life on Earth is not some random little thing that only happens once in the history of the cosmos. Life on Earth is actually programmed to be here because we have to get rid of this idea. Well, we don't have to. I try not to use must and have to because those are very strong words. It would be beneficial to learn that there are forces out there much greater than the human intellect, much greater than the ego, much greater than the body. That there is forms of consciousness that could be an entire planet, that could be the sun, that could be the galaxy, which is really nothing more than a bunch of suns and planets in a big cluster. Well, we can prove that that's going on. So I'm going to start showing you some things here. The first criticism that anyone will have when you go into a 2012 discussion is they say, well, nothing's really that different. Everything's the same. We're pretty much doing the same thing now that we've always been doing. We get a little bit of progress here, a little bit of progress there, but nothing's going on right now. There's nothing unique or special about this time in history, and I beg to differ. This is a picture that you're going to see from the fires in Australia. You may not think of this, but koalas in the wild are actually quite dangerous. They'll claw you and scratch you, and uh, they'll attack viciously to protect their home. But when it comes to these earth changes, this koala was more than willing to accept nourishment and love from a human, a wild koala. He's not scratching, he's not attacking. Now this is the thing that people don't seem to understand. The universe is built to deliver the experiences that are already happening. The universe is not a cosmic comforter that hands you a lollipop when you don't love yourself and says, oh, I'm going to just send you all these people who are going to love you because you don't love yourself and, oh, I'm sorry you don't love yourself. Let me send you loving people. <laughs> is that how it works? What happens to you when you don't love yourself? What does the universe send to you? Does it send you a lollipop? Hey, look at that. That person doesn't love themselves. That person doesn't have a high opinion of themselves. I have a puppet now. I can manipulate that puppet. I can make that person do what I want because they are too afraid to go against me. They want to be polite. They have such a low self-esteem that if I tell them something that I want them to do, they're not going to want to upset me. So what the universe actually does is that if you have a weakness, if you have something you don't like, the universe says, oh, you don't like that. Well, here, have some more. Have some more. Until you get to the point that you simply accept experience and accept yourself. And when you learn to accept yourself, you will not be manipulated because you will decide that it's better to preserve your sovereignty 
than to be manipulated by someone else. You will decide that your state of mind being positive and uplifting is a better state for you to be in than the state you're going to have to go through temporarily to really piss somebody off when they're trying to manipulate you. Because they're going to take it personally, they're going to get angry, they're going to throw hate at you. That's what they do. That's what these types of people do. Now, we're not judging those people except in so far as that they are in confusion. They are living in a confusion that makes them think that the body is who they are. And they are trying to do things to comfort the body at your expense. This is the meme that's going on in the entire planet. That's what a lot of these talks that you've been hearing are about. We are talking about how much corruption and greed and rottenness has festered into the society and the structure of civilization on earth, in the governments, in the militaries, in the corporations, in the school system, in the financial system, throughout everything, there is this corruption, this molding that has occurred. Let's get out of the idea that this is a victim consciousness that we're going through. That's what I'd recommend. You do what you want. But this is how I've decided to live. I'm not going to be anybody's victim. I'm not going to be anybody's slave. I claim, and I ask you with me right now by your applause, to claim your freedom and your sovereignty in this moment. Let's have a hand for that. All right. If you can claim your freedom of positivity, your freedom from fear, that is the most threatening thing to the negative controllers in this world. Because this is a frequency war. The one thing they don't want you to have is a positive, loving feeling in your day to day life. If they can keep you thinking that you're at the brink of destruction, that nuclear missiles are ready to incinerate the earth, that the economy is ready to collapse, that your government is ready to herd you off into concentration camps, and they've whipped up this fever to such an extent that people are bringing armed weapons to gatherings where the president is, because now Fox News wants you to think that Obama is the same old thing. I don't care if that's what you believe or not. But any time that Fox News is telling me something is true, I'm inclined to think it's not true based on their past history. Can I get an amen on that? It's a little bit disturbing when you start watching Bill O'Reilly and Glenn Beck and they're saying exactly the same things as all your favorite conspiracy websites. That's not good. That's not what we want. Because Fox is a corporate entity. It is a propaganda organ. It's also important to understand that many of the conspiracy sites have been seeded with propaganda. These are not independent bloggers that are actually trying to raise money and do an honest living. These are people that are funded by the Pentagon and the NSA. We've had extensive discussions with people about this who are insiders. So what's happening now is that because as a planet we have not loved ourselves, we have been stuck in this self-loathing, in this self-condemnation, and this fear of our own potential, this fear of our power. The universe has not sent us these majestic, loving, cosmic leaders who are all-knowing and all-powerful and can be trusted with the warmth and the innocence of a young child. They have sent us vicious killers who will do nothing but spare no expense to rape us, to steal every cent of our money. That's what happens in the universe, but it only happens until you don't need the lesson. If you learn to love yourself, do those negative people still get fixated into your life to such an extent that that's all you ever have? No. If you're one of these people who's been through self-loathing and moved into positive self-concept and self-esteem, if you have learned the power of no, as opposed to the power of now, and you can say no to somebody trying to manipulate you, then all of a sudden, 
you're not shackled to this feeling of obligation to someone who is being grotesquely unfair. You now have the wherewithal to speak your mind, to say your piece, to get your needs met, even if it means that it's going to upset someone. Because if someone has denied you the respect and the sovereignty and the love that you deserve as a perfect child of God, then you deserve to protect yourself from that person. You deserve to love yourself enough that you claim your right to exist. The universe sees that you've learned your lesson. And now the people that would have taken away your freedom and would have taken away your sovereignty can no longer do so because even one flicker of light in the darkness is enough to show you the layout of the room. And we've had enough of that now that there is a massive awakening going on. Project Camelot, and I was a part of this, happened to get involved in the center of this swine flu vaccination conspiracy. Because we had a situation unfold on stage in Zurich between myself and another witness who was arguing in favor of vaccinations and is actually a former operative for Majestic, which is the UFO working group arm of the neoconservative Republican New World Order faction of the world elite. So he's telling you you should get the vaccine. Now granted, there is a great deal of science to suggest that vaccines do confer immunity. We are not disagreeing with that. But we are also considering the testimony of people like Jane Bergemeister, a well-known mainstream journalist who happened to go alternative when she started to find out that Baxter Pharmaceuticals, as you all know, had released a vaccine and thank God these people in Norway injected it into some rats before they gave it to people and the rats all got bird flu and died. Oops. How did that happen? <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Did we do that? No, of course not. So look, you also have people in the government who are not high enough to know that this swine flu thing might have been manufactured and they have a very legitimate concern about the swine flu. It's being kept secret, but they do believe that this could mutate like it did in 1918, that you get sick the first time, it's not that bad, but you get sick the second time and everybody's dying. Millions of people are dying. That's the theory. Let's bear in mind that in 1918, the world was nowhere near as civilized as it is now. Sanitation was much less. And in order for you to have any of these flus, regardless of what they are, get your health down in a negative way, your immune system has to be depleted. What's the biggest thing in this new science I'm going to teach you about that depletes your immune system? Negative thoughts. So if they can keep you in fear, which means that you hate the government, you hate the president, you hate what's happening to your kids in school, you hate the economy, you hate the Federal Reserve, if you're angry and you're fearful all the time, and then they stick out a little virus, guess what happens to you? You get the virus. A virus is a frequency-based entity. As you see in my 2012 Enigma video, polio, rubella, all these various viruses have geometric structure, which is wave particle structure. Geometry can flip around into the time field and become a wave. There are, there, Kuznachiev, which you're going to see in this presentation, proved that the wave structure of a disease is enough to infect healthy tissue in a hermetically sealed container. You can take the wave structure of a disease, zap it through a hermetically sealed container, and have those cells inside the container catch the disease. A disease is a disease of the mind which has as its medium of transference the consciousness field. That's how you get sick. It's by going out of integrity. The nutritional component is secondary to that. When you're in an area where everybody is depressed because their living conditions are very difficult, they're going to get sick a lot more because they're so negative. So I ask you this. If you can respect yourself enough to no longer let these people into your life on a personal level, is there a hundredth monkey effect that happens to the planet? Of course, of course. And that's what's happening right now. What I said on this panel last night, what I said on the radio show that I just did with Project Camelot on Thursday, 
What I'm preparing to say on my website is that we are now at a point where we have graduated. I was told this a year ago. I was actually starting to be told this two years ago. It's now happened. We have graduated from the need to have the New World Order running the show. It's over. It's going to be over within less than a year. I'm not trying to be psychic. I'm talking in facts. I'm talking about the simple fact that you cannot lie to people who know the truth. What does a lie require to exist? It requires an absence of information. It requires you not knowing that it's a lie. Because if you're being lied to and you know that it's a lie, then it's not a lie. It becomes an obvious, ridiculous gaffe that this person is making. It becomes a situation that can be remedied because you can start laughing when that person tells you a lie. Because you know the truth. We are watching the derivative system, the Ponzi scheme and international bankers being ripped apart because the other countries are tired of playing the game. They now have more economic power than the old European white men that run the New World Order and the Illuminati. They no longer have the leverage to be able to do what they're doing. And what I propose to you on an even more intrinsic level is that this is all something that appears to be happening as a result of natural progressions of events. But on another level, it is an energetic phenomenon which is being programmed to occur by a movement into a higher energetic frequency. That frequency is making us more present with ourselves. The best thing you can do for the planet, the best thing you can do to save the children, to avoid the swine flu, to protect yourself and your finances, and to make a better world for future generations, is to stay in that state of positive, uplifting, peace and gratitude. Can I get an amen on that? Thank you. <clears throat> And I don't profess that I'm the guy you go to for the answers. You can send me your emails, I'm happy to read them. I read all my emails. But this is something that each of us are doing. I've only identified an effect that's happening to everyone. If you want to go religious for a minute, the second coming of Christ or the messianic return is something that's happening to everyone. I was talking to Jordan over dinner with Bill and Kerry the other night, and he was telling me that if you really go back into the original Old Testament documentation that the messianic figure is not one person. It represents this change into a whole new way of being. And so now he's got me convinced that I got to go looking for that data myself. He has reason to believe it's true. And I'm sure he's right, but I need to find my own facts. I don't wait for somebody else to come and teach me something. If I hear something that I like, I go look and I find out for myself. I was told from my own guidance, which is dreams and visions and prophetic information, that there was going to be a great change happening to the Earth and the solar system. I didn't just nod my head like a subservient slave to some higher power and say, yes, you're right, you're right, oh lovely master, I will do what you say. I said, no, this, I can't believe that. I can't believe that the whole world is going to change on an energetic level that will make what we're in now seem like the most miserable depression by comparison, that the life that we have now will become 100 times more harmonious, in which things like instantaneous telepathy, levitation, telekinesis, healing, and flying are so effortless that it's as easy to do as raising and lowering the diaphragm to make your lungs breathe. It requires no extra effort. That seems to be what's going on. There's all these people that we have in Earth's history from a variety of cultures, including Jesus. And if you don't want to believe in Jesus really existing, there's plenty of other cultures you can go to to look for so-called ascended masters. They're out there. Guys that have these abilities, guys that do these amazing things. All that represents is somebody who is a little bit farther ahead than you are. Not too much. We know that the ETs that are visiting us are almost entirely human. The widest divergence from a human look that you're ever going to get is the so-called gray. 
the majority of humans, and we're getting more and more whistleblowers coming forward and telling us the same thing. The ETs are our family. They look like us. They have similar types of voices that we do, although they may not use them anymore because telepathy works much better and much faster. This is like a dial-up modem. It sucks. <laughs> okay? If I could telepathically speak to you, you sorry. <laughs> How's that? If I could telepathically speak to you and just give you the download, boom, you just get the whole thing. And I don't even, I can walk off, thank you very much, good night. <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> it's already happening, isn't it? I'm giving you holographic plates. What do we know about a holographic plate? You cut it up into little pieces, you shine lasers into each one of those pieces, and what happens? Do you see one side of the hologram? You see the whole hologram, just maybe a little bit dimmer. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you all these little pieces which seem to be very interdisciplinary. I'm talking about diet, I'm talking about health, I'm talking about politics, I'm talking about science. But I'm talking about the same thing. I'm talking about you. What is your identity? What is your identity? Is it your body? No. Is it this room around you right now? That's part of it. Your body is part of it. The people sitting next to you in this auditorium, or if you're watching this on the internet, the computer screen that you're looking at, that's part of you. The chair that's touching your bottom is part of you. It's your identity. When you walk on the ground, the ground and the earth is also walking against you, not just you walking against the ground. When you go outside and you see the blue skies and you see the clouds and you see the birds and you see the trees and you hear the wind blowing through the trees, that's you. That's who you are. Energetically, we can prove that. Energetically, we can prove that all the cells in your body change every seven years. Who you are right now this body that you have, even if you have this big nasty wart on your face or something, that wart has been completely redone over seven years of time. Okay, fine. What does that mean? That means that the energy that made you change every seven years flowed through you, but it didn't get stuck there. It kept on going. Is it not true that the air that you're breathing right now as I talk to you has potentially been shared by every person in human history. That's pretty nasty if you're a germaphobic person, isn't it? <laughs> every person in the world's history has breathed the air that you're breathing. It's going round and round and round and round and round. It may be getting cleaned, but all the energy is there, and you can trace it back, and that could be scientifically proven easily. So what about you? Who are you? Who are you really? If the energy field that makes your consciousness is interpenetrated with other people's consciousness, and we can prove that, then who are you? Are you just this ego? Are you just this part of yourself that feels like you're lacking something? Because the body needs things to survive. The body needs sanitation. If you don't shower it for a while, it's going to start smelling pretty nasty. If you don't go to the bathroom, you're going to get sick and you'll eventually die. If you don't eat something, you're going to starve to death. If you don't drink something, you're going to dehydrate to death. The body is fragile. It can be cut. It can be having broken bones. You can have hair loss, skin problems. Everything can go wrong with the body. And therefore, when the body feels pain, you feel pain, and it seems like your identity is now in, in jeopardy. So because the body is so identified with the identity, we assume that our identity is the body. But we now have the scientific proof that that's not true. So your identity ultimately is the earth, the Gaia hypothesis, James Lovelock. Your identity ultimately is the sun, that which created all the particles and molecules that make you who you are now. Your identity is the galaxy, your identity is the universe. The energy that makes the universal mind is you. It's just in a slower, holographically fragmented form, like that prism I said is rotating, and all these little rainbows are there. That's all it is. 
That's all you are. But that's everything you need to be because that proves that you are the light, you are the love, you are the one infinite creator. That's all you ever have been. It's all you ever will be. And that's more than enough. Because what that means is that you have limitless potential. There is nothing special about me. The only thing that's different is that I'm very dedicated to doing what I'm doing and I'm getting in touch with that part of myself that has access to the higher consciousness and it makes me more and more of an embodiment of who I am. The more that you get in touch with the higher self, with your true cosmic identity, the more that you become one of the living master geniuses on this planet. If you had any idea of the scope of what you could be, if you truly access your potential, it would floor you because every single one of us has the potential to be a messianic figure, to be the savior of the world. We all have that potential, and we're all doing it to varying degrees as we start awakening. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Look, I could yak about this all day, but we got a lot of slides to do. So let's do some slides. The galaxy is pumping out these waves of energy which are now changing the solar system and we're going to talk about that in very concrete terms. You're going to see all the proof for that. You're also going to see the proof that the fossil record has been undergoing... Ah, I'm not getting any... Oh, okay. Never mind. The fossil record is undergoing 26 million year cycles as well as 62 million year cycles as you see in this graph here. What's causing that to happen? all life on Earth, spontaneously changing in even intervals of time. Oh, it's got to be some big rock out there that's spinning around. 62 million years is not some big rock. That's like a third of the entire orbit of the galaxy, basically. It's about a fourth. Because the galaxy is about 240 million year orbit. 62 is about, roughly speaking, it's a quarter might be exactly a quarter. That might be the point. What did the ancients know and why must we remember now? What do pyramids really do? Pyramids are harnessing the source field. We're going to get into that in a minute. We know and we can prove now that Atlantean civilization is nothing new. These pyramids around the world are not something that was built in conventional history. It was built before then. Off the western tip of Cuba, as you see in this map here, at this Guanahaca Bibius, I can't even pronounce that, the Guanahaca Bibius Peninsula, right off the tip of that, on the western tip of Cuba, you go a mile down. It's all, well, it's not quite a mile, but it's a long ways down under the surface of the ocean. And down there you find a submerged city, as this link says on BBC News. This is the only officially released side scan sonar photograph of what was actually seen down there. Does that look like random pieces of sand on the seafloor? No. This is what it actually looks like if you reconstruct it in a computer. That's a computer graphic rendering of what you just saw right here. Is everybody with me? That's not something that just showed up as a result of random geological processes. That's a human-built structure. This area could not have been above the ground and above sea level prior to 11,000 years ago. Paulina Zalitsky is here in a cave in Cuba, which used to be the Atlantean highlands, looking at inscriptions on the cave wall that are precisely the same as inscriptions that they saw being painted on the walls of these submerged cities that they sent submersible submarine probes into. What you're seeing here is a diagram of the energy fields in the solar system, which are, of course, concentric rings emanating out from the center of the sun. They also saw these cross formations painted on inscriptions in these submerged cities. Now here is the only other photograph that she's ever released. This is a still frame from a much longer film where she's flying a submersible through this city. What do you see in the window of her monitor? Would you like to see it more up close? That's not just a little piece of sand on the bottom of the ocean. That's a pyramid. Would you like to see a pyramid in Egypt that it looks very similar to? Here we go. This is called the Bent Pyramid of Dasher on the right. 
It's almost identical to what you see on the left. And that is submerged off the western tip of Cuba. It's down there right now. What are we doing by not going and looking at it? Why did they sell this story to National Geographic and it just so happened to never make it out in 2003? National Geographic did a 360 degree contract. They bought all the rights. It was supposed to be the biggest thing ever to come out in 2003 and guess what happened? <laughs> Nothing. Well, what we have now is evidence that somebody out there who's responsible for building the seal into the dollar knew that these pyramids harness some sort of energy field. Because what you're seeing is clearly an energetic, non-physical structure going down onto the top of the pyramid here. This great grants the next question. I talked about the time field. I talked about the Russians. Is there a technology in which you can build something that will take this natural energy that makes physical matter, that's flowing through everything, and harness that energy in a given direction? The answer is yes. You're going to have some fun now. You're going to get to look at some things that are already well known to exist. And I'm going to let you just think about them. The first is menhirs, which are standing stones. I want you to bear in mind that the height of a human being is only a little bit taller than where the top of the shadow is in this photograph. These are enormous, enormous stones. Do you think that maybe these enormously tall stones were built for a reason? Do you think that maybe these ancient peoples were putting them there because they got something out of it? Is it merely a religious symbol? Or was it put there because it had a technological usefulness? Do they put these headstones over your grave because it's just decorative? Or are they hoping that the headstone is going to have some sort of energetic effect that will keep your body preserved and usher you on into the afterlife. Can these stones actually create ripples of energy that will rise our frequency of consciousness, that will make us feel better, that will make us healthier, that will make everything around us more harmonious? If you think about the possibility that these stones could be put into position and change the way that your mind works, then you're thinking in the right direction. They're enormous, and it would be a lot of work to do that just for some religious symbolism. It would be much more apropos to believe that people would go to all this trouble if they could use it for something. Next thing we're going to look at is dolmens. These are stone cellars. What if you were able to build a little stone cellar, a little stone structure, get inside of it and have it harness energy so that while you're sitting in there, you meditate, and it raises your vibration? It raises the consciousness frequency of your mind while you're inside. And all you have to do is sit under this absolutely colossal stone that if it fell would crush you flat instantaneously. <laughs> Very precariously, this is Kilcluny in Ireland. Look at that thing. Look at how that gigantic stone that weighs more than two 18-wheelers at least, if not much more, if that little guy were to just fall off of the tips of the other stones, he would crush you flat. And yet, there he is, and with all the earthquakes and with all the earth changes that have gone on, it's still balanced precariously right up there. And here's another one, balanced precariously. Why would they go to so much trouble? Do you really think a bunch of guys are just going to do this because it's cool? Do you really think they'd go to the trouble of getting themselves crushed and trying to precariously balance these very, very massive stones? just because it's a fun thing to do? I don't think so. In this case, you see that actually part of the stone is broken off and fallen onto the ground, but the point is the same. The point is, look at what's going on there. You go underneath, you meditate, and you get charged up. Now, this is an example of a more advanced structure where a wall is built around you. And once you go inside that wall, you now have a much, much higher energetic charge and you got a little breathing hole. This is another one from the side. Uh, you, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> no, actually, I did this in a rush, and I don't know where all these locations are, but it's easy to find online. Just look for dolmens, and you'll start... Go to Google Pictures, Google Images, Google dolmen, the word dolmen, D-O-L-M-E-N, you'll start finding these things. 
Barrows is the next thing. Barrows are mounds. The idea here is that you actually drill a hole into the ground underneath the mound. There is a round chamber inside the mound. This is well known. You go in there and you have a little party and you meditate. It's enough now that you can bring in a group of people. It does the same thing as a dolmen, except you're, bur you're bur burrowing into the earth now. So here's some barrows. And this one, of course, you see how well structured it is, Silbury Hill being the biggest one. Now here's one of the entrances, which of course, the English government has been kind enough to put iron bars in front of it so you can't go in there. They don't want you to be able to use this technology anymore. And they're probably worried about finding condoms and stuff inside, <laughs> frankly. But that's not what it's built for, necessarily. Maybe it was. Some of these barrows are longer. And you also have the mound builders in the US. You have all these other things like Serpent Mound in Ohio that you can go to and see this in the US. It's the, I'm only doing the English ones right now. Henges is the one that everybody's so familiar with and everybody loves because now you get standing stones like the single ones you were seeing before, except now there's certain areas where the energetics are so high that long rows of stones are being put together because it's going to be even more powerful. The sheep really like being near these stones. In fact, animal life really can feel this more than we can. These were not put there by accident. And again, in this case, you have a combination of a barrow and a henge. You have the henge at the front here, and if you go through that path down the middle, you go into the barrow, and you go inside and you meditate. Maybe the henge in the front helps focus the energy that's flowing through the center of the barrow. Here's another henge out there just hanging out in the middle of the English countryside, and there's some of them are in France, some of them are in Germany. They're in Ireland too, they're all over the place. Here's another one. Of course, the one, well, here's another one, here's another example. One of the most impressive, which unfortunately has been lost to the ravages of time to a large degree, is Avebury. Now, what you're going to see here, if you look closely, is that all of these different uh, stones, all of these different little dots that you see as you go along here represent individual stones. This looks like a giant serpent. Here's the head, and here's what it's eaten in its stomach. If you look up at the top in the middle there, there's two little uh, rings of stones inside. That represents the meal, and then here's the tail down at the bottom. Down here is one of the barrows. This is Silbury Hill, the best barrow of all, the most famous one and the most well-structured one. Look at the geometry. Look at how it's a perfect equilateral triangle between the head of the snake, the tail of the snake, silvery in the middle, and then here's the area up here. Now what this was for, this was a gigantic technology. This is a machine. It's a machine that's built based on, if you look around it, the contours of the mountains, the contours of the land, so that a bunch of people get inside this area right here and they have a big party and they all meditate and chant and run around and do fun stuff and they're changing consciousness for themselves and for the planet. That's what this stuff was built for. It's a consciousness technology. Of course, Stonehenge being the greatest example of all, these sarsen stones as they're called, are gigantic in size and very beautiful to look at. What you may not realize is that at one time there was a whole ring of them like this. That's what it used to look like, and all the stones that have fallen have been identified in the soil, because the more they fall down over time, the more that it rains each year, they fall further and further into the ground, but they've all been found. So this is known to be true. I'm not making this up. What we know is that Stonehenge was used to identify solstices and when the moon and the sun were traveling, and what would happen, because during certain planetary alignments, certain times of the year, these zones on the Earth became much more energetically active. Are these ancient structures connected? The answer is yes, through the signs of ley lines. This was done by Sir Alfred Watkins. and We're going to talk a little bit about him. He found in the 1920s that ancient holy sites lined up in straight lines, which he called lays. Sites from extremely different ages, millennia apart, were all aligned with one another. This includes the Neolithic Age, which is Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and the Christian Era. Now, he would use this camera to basically be able to look across long distances and see if things were in a straight line. Now, what you see here is the summary of a massive amount of research that he did. 
what you see here is every single one of these words is a different ancient sacred site. Nobody ever comes out in the open and says, oh, by the way, all these sacred sites are built in a straight line. It took a guy like Alfred Watkins to analyze this and discover it for himself. But guess what a lot of these things are? They're cathedrals. Do you think that maybe the Knight Templars knew that there was something going on? Hmm. Do you think that maybe they knew to build on that line and not to build off the line? Do you think that maybe if you build a church which acts as a funnel for this consciousness energy, that if you build that domed roof for the church out of stone over that line, that it's going to harness more of this energy field from the universe and that in so doing, it's going to become a resonator so that when you go to church, you're going to be experiencing a revelation, a higher consciousness. Do you think that maybe the stained glass window and the Gregorian chant music are creating harmonics that help you harmonize with the field? Absolutely. So here's some people from his Stonehenge Club, the Straight Track Club as it was called, the Ley Line Hunters. Here's a barrow that had trees growing around it. Here's a, a similar ring of trees without a barrow. This is a natural earth effect caused by these energy fields because they do have circular formations. Well, it is a hyperdimensional effect. These are harnessing hyperdimensional energy because the hyperdimensional energy is what makes the matter that is building the stones. Let me say that again. The matter that makes these stones, the stone itself, the actual hard stuff, is built from hyperdimensional energy, energy from the time field that's flowing into our space-time. That's what, according to Dr. Dewey Larson, all matter is built from is this hyperdimensional exchange between three-dimensional time, three-dimensional space. That's all it is. So, of course, you're going to get time anomalies. But it's also the energy that builds you. It builds your DNA. It builds your body. So when you get more of it flowing through you, you're going to have more health and vitality. And because it's the energy of your consciousness, because it is consciousness, it's also going to give you a, a more advanced intellect. So the way that we can actually prove that this global grid, these energy lines, has a hyperdimensional effect that can completely pull you out of our three space of length, width, and height, the three-dimensional world, is with the research of Ivan Sanderson. He investigated a massive number of different disappearances of ships and airplanes. What he did is he took everything from every single ancient, uh, I'm sorry, everything from the disappearance since planes were discovered. And he found that the majority of what he was finding all clustered around 12 points on the Earth's surface. That's completely unprecedented. That's not mainstream information. It was done in the 1960s. This guy should have been treated with as much respect as somebody like Edison or Einstein. Planes and ships are spontaneously disappearing. He wasn't looking he didn't have anything in mind when he started doing this. All he did is he looked up each one and he gave it a push pin, push pin, push pin. And where were all the push pins at the end? They were in 12 places. Even stranger is that the 12 places are not just haphazardly scattered around the earth. They're all equally distant from each other. They're harmonically balanced with one another. They're all the same distance apart when you look to the ones that are adjacent to each other. If you connect the dots, you get a sacred geometry which happens to be the same geometry that's in the polio virus, the same geometry that's in many other viruses at the quantum level, including HIV. But it's not just a negative, toxic thing like viruses. It's a very positive thing that's the fundamental building block of physical matter and biology and life. It's an icosahedron. Now, here we go. This is the Bermuda Triangle. Obviously, you know about this one. Believe me when I tell you that there are many, many airplane disappearances that cannot be explained where they've never found oil slick or flotsam on the surface of the water. All they find is a missing plane. It's on the radar one minute, it's gone the next. There's no oil slick, there's no wreckage, nothing. And they don't find anything on the surface, on the bottom of the ocean floor either. It's gone. <coughs> what happened is it's passing through a portal. It's passing through a time gate a gate into another frequency of reality, a parallel universe in which time is three-dimensional. 
Here are the 12 points that he discovered with his push pins. Take a close look. You see the Bermuda Triangle off the coast of Florida. You see another one near Brazil and South America. You see another one here uh, on the land in Africa, another one down here by Sri Lanka. You see one that's the Himalayan mountains, all that crazy stuff like the master and teachings of the Far East, Tibet, all that stuff up there. You got some that are out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean here, which is a real lonely area to get stuck in. The Easter Island is down here. And then you got one here, which is the Devil's Triangle. That's uh, officially been declared a disaster area by the Japanese government. They do not allow you to fly or sail through this area. You also have two bracketing Australia, and that's very important. Australia, if you notice, is the only continent that is completely pinned between actually four. Because what he doesn't show you on this map is that there's one down here on the South Pole, one up here on the North Pole. So you got one, two, three, four. Australia is perfectly in the geometric center of four of the most important nodes. So there's a lot of crazy stuff, and the exact geometric center of the nodes happens to be right where Pine Gap is, which is one of the biggest bases where all this stuff is being done. You connect the dots together, you get your icosahedron, which as you see here on the left is a geometry. This is what it looks like superimposed over the Earth's surface on the right. Now, this is where it gets even more interesting. These three Russian scientists, and everybody laughs when I say their name, <laughs> Goncharov, Morozov, and Makarov, See, you're not laughing because I told you it's not cool to laugh. So, like, now you don't want to laugh. What they did is they went through and they looked at every single line that was discovered by Sir Alfred Watkins. Remember the guy that did the ley lines? We were just talking about that, how all these churches and all these Neolithic sites and Iron Age sites and Bronze Age sites, they're all in straight lines. Well, these Russian dudes took every single one of those things that Alfred Watkins discovered and they took every single other structure they could find around the world, the Great Pyramid, Stonehenge, Easter Island, temples and pagodas in Asia, China, Japan. They looked at every single weird monolithic, which means big stone structure they could find anywhere in the world. And they found that every single one of them fit onto a single grid, which was very simple to construct. All you had to do is start with the same 12 points that Ivan Sanderson found where these matter time-space warps would happen. Take those 12 points, connect the dots, just like I did. That's the icosahedron. But then, the icosahedron has a curious property. It's a geometry that, because it is perfect, can be inverted. It's a mathematical thing you can do where you flip the geometry inside out, literally. That's what it would be. If you add the structure, like made out of wires, you could actually flip it inside out and rebuild it, but build it backwards. Build the geometric inverse of it. All you got to do is inverse the icosahedron and make it so that it fits together with the original icosahedron, and you get this grid. Here it is. So I want to point out to you again, because this is a little bit confusing if you don't know what you're looking at, that all of your original points are still there. Here's, you know, the Bermuda Triangle. Here's the one on the southern tip. Here's the two that I was talking about around Australia, the one that's up there. Here's the one at the South Pole. So they're all still there, but now you've added in the, the geometric opposite. If you simply build this geometry, you now have a diagram that shows you where every single ancient site in the entire world has been constructed on, over 4,000. They couldn't find a single one that was anything impressive that wasn't built on this grid. Why do you think that is? If you, have an out, if you have a wire that's going to go to something that powers an electrical appliance, are you going to put the wire under your armpit and expect that it's going to work? No. You plug it into the wall. If you build a pyramid and you don't build it on this grid, do you think that it's going to work? Not anywhere near as good. You got to build it where the energy is. That's why with these cold fusion guys, they're looking at the cold fusion reactions they build devices that actually work in some places, but then they bring it somewhere else and it doesn't work anymore. It's on 60 Minutes. They've talked about this. Well, we don't understand. It's, oh, it must not work. It must, and then, then the scientists say, well, it's the whole technology is wrong. No. It's because if you're on the grid, it's going to work. It's very simple. Let's put all of the cold fusion devices on the grid where they work, and then we'll wire them up, and we're done. Just build it where it needs to go. It's very simple. 
You have energy in one place and it's not somewhere else. It happens to be the energy of the time field. Well, look at what else you got here. You got the mid-Atlantic ridge. This is the volcanic ridge that defines what's pushing apart the two continents. And if you start looking at the next grid, which is the Becker-Hagen's grid, They've basically taken the same thing. The black dots are Ivan Sanderson's 12 vortexes. Again, all the matter, time, space, warping going on there. You have all the points of the geometric inverse of the icosahedron, but what they do is they actually take two icosahedrons and they put one out of phase with the other. Rather than inverting it, they just take a second icosahedron and make it a little bit out of phase. We have a phone ringing. That's a sign. Do you guys need a break? No? See, we're, we're having mutiny, Carrie. What should we do? The troops don't know what to do. OK. <laughs> All right, we'll do a short meditation and mentally clear the room. That's why we got the cell phone ringing and distracting me. I would ask that you just take a couple minutes Take a nice deep breath now. If you need to use the restroom, please go, because this is going to be enough time that you can actually have a break if you need one. I won't be offended, I promise. Some of you are hardcore, and you're just going to sit through this. That's cool. Either way is fine. I won't judge you. We'll just laugh about you once you're out of the room. I'll make jokes about you. <laughs> and let's go into the infinite peace of this moment. You may want to close your eyes. You may want to spend a little time relaxing. And just give yourself over to the loving presence of the cosmos. Let yourself feel the articulations of intelligent infinity, which speak to you in the moments between moments. Give yourself an opportunity to relax into the full awareness of who you are. Take comfort in the beauty of you. Take pleasure in the divine energy that makes you who you are. As you tune in deeper and deeper to yourself, you become a pyramid. You become a standing stone. You become a lens of light for cosmic energy to flow through. It doesn't require you to spend any money. It doesn't require you to have any advanced degree or university education. It doesn't require you to drink anything, eat anything, take any pill, smoke anything. All it requires is peace. All it requires is tranquility. All it requires is the knowingness that you are more than your physical body. That you are a divine light, a glorious gift from the cosmos. That any and all negativity that has hung around you can be cleansed away, much like a traditional housewife would sweep out the house with a broom. With all the doors open, the dust comes flying out. The floors become clean. It becomes easier and easier to walk around undisturbed, to appreciate the bounty of your own space, the bounty of your own sovereign identity. For when you learn to love yourself, you can have those boundaries. You can sweep out the dust in your own life, as we're now doing on the planet. The very air that passes through your lungs is the living conduit of universal light that carries you like a magic carpet to lands unseen that float in the sky. Lands that are beyond physicality. You have every opportunity to reach out and find those lands. You have the glory of being yourself in this moment. You have an opportunity to expand your awareness so that that mind that thinks through the hardware of the brain is not just the mind of your personal ego. 
but the universal mind that is much more than just your own personal self. It is the self with a capital S. Let's experience that self. Because as you do, the energy flows through you, and it is an energy that creates an impenetrable shield that no negativity can penetrate. It is a living vessel of light, the chalice of the Holy Grail that allows you to be perfectly sovereign in mind and in body and in spirit. By living through that consciousness, you live in the presence of your everlasting awareness, your eternal identity, which is never going to be terminated by the loss of a body. It is much more than that. Your mind is information, and the information has identity, and the identity is the universe. So now I will start to bring you back into the conscious mind. Most of our friends have gone to the bathroom now. So we're all back in the room. I'd like you to see again this grid. Open your eyes and let's meditate on that grid for a minute. You're seeing the underlying geometric framework of the mind of the earth. And this is how it's been built. And this is what structures the continents the way they are. Look at how the coast of Rio de Janeiro here is pushed in by this node. Look at how the whole shape of South America is defined by the lines that surround it. There's many, many examples of this. This is the stretching pattern that the Earth makes as it expands. You can see island chains that are part of circles. Here's another island chain that's part of a larger circle. Just connect those nodes together. Look at the two points in the middle. It looks like cell mitosis. That's not an accident. Oh, really? Well, that's interesting. I was just informed that there was a UFO sighting right outside the building at the time that the cell phone went off. <laughs> Believe it or not, but uh, that's pretty cool. Well, thank you guys for showing up. Actually, there's a whole bunch of them on the ceiling here. <laughs> cool. All right. Hopefully, you're a little bit less hypnotized now, and we'll get back into a, enough of a thinking mind that you can... Follow me. Can we prove the ancient sites harnessed usable energy? The Russian pyramids research holds the key. The Russians, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, had all of their military industrial complex, all of their infrastructure, and they had the laboratories available to be able to build pyramids and study what they would do, and that's what they did. Here are actual photographs of the Russian pyramids. Check this out. These are enormous. These are little bitty those little dots down there, those are people, okay? So look at that, look at the size of that thing. Here's somebody posing in front of it. Here's what it looks like on the inside. It's made of PVC plastic pipes with a fiberglass facing. Sometimes they were built near oil fields, as you can see here. Sometimes they were built out in the countryside. That's a smaller one. Here he is posing in front of it. Now some very, very strange things happened when they did this. If they built one over an oil well, it would become 25% more productive, and the oil that came out was 25% purer. It would make poisonous chemicals no longer poisonous to the body. They would become safe enough that you could dump it on your skin or drink it and you were fine. I do not recommend that you try this, okay? But that's what they said they found. Uh, diseases would be cured, even cancer. It's an energetic phenomenon. They had uh, white underbred mice and they injected them with a toxin that would normally destroy them. If 60% of the mice died from the toxin in the laboratory, when they put those same mice under the pyramid, guess how many of them died? Only 6%. So 94% of all the mice injected with a lethal toxin that put, were put in the pyramids that they built here that you just saw, didn't die. Up to 400% increase in the productivity of agricultural seeds. You throw these seeds into the pyramid, guess what happens? You grow the same plants, but now they're 400% larger and they got better fruit. Everything is better about them. So you can grow super seeds. Strong electrical activity. You could put a little voltage pile, a little battery on top of the pyramid, and it generates current. It's fascinating. Significant earthquake reduction. This is where you start seeing how the Earth's energy fields 
are related to severe weather and severe earth changes. If you build these pyramids, then guess what happens with earthquakes? You don't get a big giant quake anymore. You get a bunch of little ones that don't cause any damage. You also see an enormous column of energy hundreds of miles wide around the pyramid. This is not electromagnetic energy. This is the energy that the Russians can measure, which they call torsion fields or the time field. That energy column, that hundreds of miles wide energy column from one pyramid is enough to cause big storm fronts coming through to kind of go around it, like there's a big circle there. They just whoop, go right around it. It's crazy. It's been proven. What they also did is they took giant slabs of granite that they were going to use to build these jail cells in Russia. That's a lot better than an American jail cell, isn't it? Take these granite slabs, and they built 5,000 prisoner cells from these granite slabs, and then they watched these guys. They didn't do anything else to their environment. They didn't do anything else to their diet or their medication. Now, one could argue, well, maybe the prisoners were really happy that they had a nice granite you know, <laughs> cell that they could hang out in, but that's not enough to explain what happened because they had a profound improvement in their attitude and behavior, including substantial increase in addiction recovery from alcoholism and drug abuse. So all these prisoners that are living in these jail cells that were charged up with granite from the pyramid, that's all that it was, all their behavior starts improving because they're living inside a harmonic resonating chamber. The, the granite crystals have actually changed their structure. If you think about how you magnetize an iron nail, you take a piece of, of iron, right, like a, like a nail, and you start stroking it with a magnet. And the more that you do that, eventually it becomes magnetized and you can pick things up with it. But we know that the reason why that works is that all the molecules, all the molecules in the iron are now going north to south in their electrical charge in the same direction. That's what starts to cause it to happen. So we know that you can do it to metal. You don't see anything different about the nail, but we know that it becomes magnetic because the atoms are changing inside. The pyramid does the same thing to crystal. You put the granite crystals inside, the crystals change. I don't have it in the slideshow here, but another thing they did was just to take a bunch of granite rocks and just throw them all over the floor and leave them there. And what they found was that if they came back after a few months, the, gra the granite is usually a reddish color. They came back after a few months and there were rings in the rocks that they'd just thrown on the ground and the rings were whitish. The granite changed color. It actually changed from a reddish color to a whitish color in a ring. That's how much these fields change crystals and their actual structure. This proves when you get to the point of earthquakes and how earthquakes can be changed and reduced by the pyramids and how human behavior is improved by the pyramids. You just put the prisoners in those granite cells and they get much better. This proves that our consciousness is tethered to the Earth's consciousness. You harness the Earth's consciousness with the pyramid, which acts like a funnel for this energy. The energy that builds each molecule of the pyramid is an energy that is in you. So the energy that makes you who you are can be harnessed in the pyramid just by the fact that it's shaped that way because there's an energy that flows into every atom in that pyramid. And if the pyramid is a perfect sphere, then it's gonna all flow in the same way. But if it's a funnel shape, it's gonna flow in with a directional current. That's all it is, it's a funnel. It's very, very simple. This proves a connection between our consciousness and earthquakes, a connection between our consciousness and severe weather, a strong likelihood that our consciousness is directly affecting the Earth. That's a very important point. The, of course, the greatest pyramid of all is not surprisingly called the Great Pyramid. And we... Uh, well, I'll, I'll be there and then I'll be making my way back to, uh, to the ho hotel room and stuff. So uh, if, if you can do it, you know, grab me. If not, you know, just uh, talk to Don Bogus and give him all his... Okay, well, you can email uh, both of us, you know, the bill, on email. Okay, well, then just give it to us. And, and if you have to, leave it at the front gate.